Okay. Hi everyone, I'm Kai and welcome to World Space Week 2021 webinars presented by Art of Inquiry. Get ready to learn, be amazed and explore. I'm currently 12 and turning 13 next year and I love all things STEM. I'm currently doing calculus and chemistry and I've been in this astrobiology program for about three years and it's something that I've really learned so much from. Astrobiology is just a topic for me that brings out so many cool ideas. Like every week I'm learning about something new that I've never heard of before. Thank you, Kai. Um, I'm Ryan, your other uh, co-host today. I'm an intern working with, uh, with Julia in the Art of Inquiry. Um, but this meeting's not about me at all, so I just want to give a, a very brief intro to our speaker, and then I'll let him take over. And uh, we'll just be kind of, Kai and I will sort of moderate through everyone's questions and make sure they all get answered. Um, uh, also, if, if we don't get to your question right away, just be a little patient with us. Don't, no need to ask it again or anything. We'll get to it um, as soon as we're able to, unless it really seems like we missed it. Um, just give us a few minutes to get to it. That way we don't interrupt or anything. So today we have a, uh, a pretty exciting talk from our speaker, Larry Clays. Yep. Um, Larry is a, an author and a technical writer um, with a passion for, for sciences and nature. Um, and today's talk really exemplifies one of those passions. Uh, so uh, I won't give away too much else. I'll, I'll let Larry take over from here. Um, <laughs> so feel free to share your screen or, or Say anything more about yourself if you'd like. Otherwise, it's all yours. Thank okay. you. Well, Ryan and Kai and Julia, thank you very much for that very kind introduction. And let me pop up my slideshow here and we will begin. Can everyone see it? It's good for me. Looks okay. good here. Too. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. Well, welcome everyone. Um, to my uh, talk for 2021. As you can see, it's uh, called Real Star Treks, How Humanity Plans to Reach the Stars. Um, I thought I've, it's something that's always fascinated me since as long as I can remember, and I know it fascinates a lot of other people, is um, how are we going to reach the stars one day? How are we going to fly across the galaxy? And... Uh, you know, and the thing is, it's uh, science fiction has certainly dealt with it a lot, but uh, also real scientists and real engineers and real physicists have also looked into the problem. So, um, and so believe it or not, there are real concepts for real starships out there that might someday uh, take us to other planetary systems and beyond. So let us begin. Now, you're probably most familiar with, uh, st with starships from science fiction. And as you notice, they make it re look pretty easy, uh, not much tougher than hopping in your car, turning on the key and stepping on the gas. Uh, you get into a starship, you get in your seat, press a few buttons, say engage, and off you go. And as we can see here, these two famous examples, uh, the USS Enterprise, from Star Trek going into warp and the Millennium Falcon from Star Wars, which goes into hyperdrive. Um, these ships, these starships don't, uh, you know, they don't just fly through space. They fly faster than the speed of light, uh, which allows them to get across incredible distances in very short times, because let's face it, um, TV shows have about 50 minutes counting commercials and movies maybe two hours. So you can't spend how long it would really take to get from one star system to another. So thus we've invent, uh, they've come up with these uh, drives, these propul methods of propulsion that can take uh, ships and their crews across incredibly vast distances in really short time periods. So 
yeah, science fiction makes it look really easy. And that's why people ask, you know, why don't we have this? Uh, people ask, why hasn't NASA built uh, the USS Enterprise? Well, there's a number of issues to contend with uh, called reality. And the first one is the distances in our galaxy alone are vast. We live in a stellar island called the Milky Way Galaxy. It is about 100,000 light years across, uh, 1,000 light years uh, wide on its edge. And there's about 400 billion star systems, billion, not million, billion, 400 billion. And as we recently learned uh, with Kepler and other space satellites, we now think almost all these star systems have, um, have, plan have planets of their own. And most of these stars average several light years apart. Uh, for example, our nearest star system is Alpha Centauri, which is composed of two suns similar to ours and a third sun, which is a red dwarf. It's about 4.3 light years away. Now, what is a light year? It's the light, it's the distance light travels in one year, which comes out to about 6 trillion miles. Um, light and radio waves are the two fastest things in the universe. Uh, they go at 186,000 miles per second. Um, at that speed, you could reach the moon in two seconds, whereas for Apollo, it took three days for them to get there. You could get to Pluto in five hours. And you could get to our nearest star system, Alpha Centauri, in 4.3 years. That's pretty fast. But there's, a, there's, um, there's some problems with that. Uh, trying to even get to a decent fraction of the speed of light is incredibly difficult. Now, here's a real-world example. Th these are the, this is the Voyager uh, 1 space probe. It also has a twin Voyager 2. Um, in 1977, it was launched from Earth, and it explored the outer solar system. And it was sent fast enough so that it could fly by all the four giant outer planets and their moons so it could reach them. And at the same time, it could also escape from our, our entire solar system and head out into the wider Milky Way galaxy. Now, Voyager is currently going about, give or take, 34,000 miles per hour. That's pretty fast. You know, 34,000 miles per hour? Um, you could get around the Earth in less than an hour at that speed. But when you're talking interstellar distances, it's, it's a snail's pace. So as we see here, Voyager 1, the fastest probe we've ever sent out of the solar system, um, if it was heading towards Alpha Centauri, which it is not, it's not heading towards anywhere in particular, and of course all its systems will be long dead um, by the year 2030, uh, it would take over 77,000 years just to get to the distance of Alpha Centauri, 4.3 light years. 77,000 years. That's the reality. And that's one of the fastest ships we have now. Uh, needless to say, most uh, science fiction movies and TV series, you know, don't want to take that long. Crew, the crews would all be dead or they would have interchanged over many ger generations. So, you know, what do you do? What do you do? You know, we our chemical, our chemical rockets, our, our most powerful chemical rockets cannot, um, cannot go, you know, push any ship fast enough to reach another star system in any reasonable amount of time. As we see here, um, you know, you can't even, even, even if you could go, even if you could attain almost the speed of light, 99% of the speed of light, it would still take you, you know, 4.3 years to go to Alpha Centauri. Um, as we saw back here, it would take 28,000 years to go to the, reach the center of the galaxy, 100,000 light years to cross, this is Earth years, by the way. Uh, to cross the entire galaxy. 
So, you know, what, you know, and especially if you have a crew on board, or even if you don't have a crew, if you send a robot probe out, um, the people that sent the mission out aren't going to be around. It's going to be their descendants who finally get the data back, assuming that could happen. And uh, so you might have, you might be asking yourself here, well, why don't we go faster than the speed of light? I mean, they do it on Star Trek every week. You know, Star Wars does it. Why can't we do it now? Well, uh, there's a reason, and it isn't just technical. It's also physics. Um, Albert Einstein found out that if you want to attain the speed of light, to actually go at the speed of light, uh, you would need, and you would end up being, you need more and more energy for your ship until you actually reached infinity. You would need an infinite amount of energy for a ship that could go at the speed of light and then and it couldn't even and then forget even going faster. So there's that barrier. It's um it's not like the sound barrier or anything like that. Whereas you just go fast enough and you have the right ship, you can make it. This is a literal physical barrier. Now there are ways to get around it, but we're going to talk about that later. So since we now are now know that we can't since since we now know that we cannot go at or beyond the speed of light at least as we know of now you know what are we going to do um how are we ever going to get a spaceship to another star system especially one that gets there before uh you know it ends up being our grand great grandchildren uh you know reaping the rewards well believe it or not there are real methods to get to for reaching other stars. Now they don't exist yet. They haven't been built, but for the last 50 or so or 50 or more years, people have been designing act real scientists, real engineers have been designing actual possible starships that could move at a decent fraction of the speed of light and get to another star system within a couple decades, maybe a hundred years at most. And I'd now like to introduce to you some of these real possible starships. And these, and I'd like to emphasize, these are not science fiction. While they haven't been built yet, may not be built, they are all scientifically and technically plausible. Um, one of the first ships that we, uh, that were ever conceived of, that we could actually build today with current technology and could even do it a number of decades ago was a ship called the Orion. Now, this is not the Orion that NASA is currently using to launch uh, missions, uh, humans to the moon and possibly Mars. This is a different mission. Back in the 1950s, at the height of the Cold War, uh, some scientists came up with the idea of hey, uh, instead of taking those nuclear bombs and uh, destroying civilization, how about we use their energy to uh, push a ship to uh, other planets in our solar system and beyond? And thus the concept of Orion was born. Orion is, it just, it, the audacity of it is amazing. What you would do technically is, you would have the crew quarters up front, as you see on the right, and on the left, um, in this picture, is where you would store all your nuclear bombs. Then what you would do is you would shoot a nuclear bomb out one at a time, and you would explode it at the back of the ship. Now, if you look in the far left of the picture, there's a huge metal plate that's called the pusher plate. What happens is the bomb explodes, the force of the explosion hits the pusher plate, and that in turn pushes the ship. And if you keep doing that enough, you will push it, the ship faster and faster until it reaches phenomenal speeds. Um, as they conceived it at the time, uh, as they conceived it at the time, uh, an Orion could make it to Pluto in a year or Mars in a matter of months. And now, is the, now there is a question I'm going to assume, I hope you'll be asking at this point is, how in the world could this actually work? I mean, wouldn't setting off nuclear bombs and not just one, but a bunch at the back of a ship end up destroying it 
instead of pushing it to the stars. Oh, by the way, I should add, uh, the Orion concepts can, they came up with, they figured it actually could reach Alpha Centauri in about 100 years. That's long, but it's a lot shorter than 77,000 years. So the answer to this is yes, they've, the ship could actually survive the explosion. The pusher plate would not only act um, as a, a thing to, to kick, for lack of a better word, to move the ship, but it would also protect the ship. Now, that doesn't mean it would last forever, but it would survive long enough to do the job to protect the ship from the radiation and what else, whatever else. And as you notice, the crew quarters are way at the other end of the uh, nuclear bombs. And uh, as Carl Sagan once said, it's probably the best use he could ever imagine for nuclear weapons, uh, actually exploring stars instead of uh, threatening to kill each other, to be blunt. So now Orion was actually tested in 1959. No, not with nuclear, it's never been tested with nuclear bombs, but a model that is now hanging in the Smithsonian Air and Space Museum, or it was, um, they used conventional explosives and they launched it off a launch pad. And by God, that probe called the hot rod actually flew way up into the air and every explosion that came out behind it didn't destroy the pusher plate and it pushed the ship faster. So it is theoretically possible. And as I said, Orion could be built today. We could reach the stars in about a hundred years if we started building such a ship now. Um, so that's, that's Orion. Um, and if you're in case you're wondering whatever happened, um, in 19, they were working on it. Uh, a lot of, even the air force got involved. Uh, NASA got involved, uh, but then in 1963, the United States uh, Nuclear Test Ban Treaty happened, um, which prohibited, uh, because up until then, from 1945 until 1962, um, the various superpowers that had nuclear weapons were constantly testing them above ground. And in the United States case, with something called Operation Starfish in 1962, they detonated a nuclear bomb in Earth orbit. It fried a whole bunch of satellites. <laughs> so uh, people came. People decided that, that well, this has really got to be controlled. So no more nuclear testing anywhere on Earth, space, or in the ocean. Only underground. And of course, what this this also took out Orion and. The project drifted away, but had it worked and it could have been done safely by putting, you know, putting it together in orbit and launching it away from Earth, um, we could have had ships that literally reached the the very edges of the solar system within a year, and we could have sent a mission to Alpha Centauri that would reach it in about a hundred years. Um, it has been mothballed, but people still talk about it coming back. And honestly, if it's done right, it, it could be a great way to get around the solar system and sa much more safely than you might think. So that's a Project Orion. That was one of the first real interstellar um, vehicle concepts that ever came up with. And before you move to the next one, we actually have two quick yes, questions, sir. if you don't mind. Please, no, pl I was, uh, yeah, anytime you need to have me pause, I'm happy to. Go ahead. Uh, I'll start with this one, actually, was would a crew member feel the immense uh, acceleration um, from these these nuclear uh, explosions going on far away from them on the ship? Um, no, I, I can't speak 100% exactly, but I'm going to say no, because if you can you see in the picture, can you see my cursor? Does my cursor show up? Yeah. yeah oh, yes. great. Do you see where the see where my cursor is circling? Yep, that front part there. Okay, these are the shock absorbers. Now, these aren't the shock absorbers you have in your car. These things are huge, and they're powerful. And they can handle a nuclear bomb hitting this metal pusher plate and slamming into it. Uh, like I said, these people really tried to think everything out. And what it does is it pushes on the ship, but the shock absorber absorbs all the energy. Yeah, I mean... You could not have a, a ship 
where a nuclear bomb's going off, I mean, the shock alone would kill everybody. <laughs> you know, you'd be jolted back and forth the first time. And even if the radiation and the, the heat of the explosion didn't get you, the impact would. So they thought that up. Uh, like I said, they never built an actual ship. So it's hard to, I can't say 100%. But these shock absorbers would protect the rest of the crew, which is way down at the other end. Um, they would probably notice through navigational instruments that they're going faster. But um, you have to get up to the... Now, the ship would not reach the speed of light. It would get about 12% of the speed of light. Um, you wouldn't start seeing any major relativistic effects, which means you wouldn't see stars starting to shift in your view and other, you know, time slowing down. That's another interesting thing, too, as you approach the speed of light, time slows down. You, you've probably heard of that. Um, uh, Einstein came up with it, that if you could go at the speed of light and you had a twin brother at home on Earth and you went in a spaceship and you went out for, say, 50 years at the speed of light and you came back, you would have aged maybe a couple of years, but your brother would be like an elderly man. That can happen, but it wouldn't be a major effect with this ship or any or most of the other ones I'm going to be showing you next. That actually brings up the that second question that there was, though, is... Um, oh, great. Okay. Somebody somebody asked also, uh, There's is there absolutely no way to go faster than the speed of light? If if you will be patient, we're going to get to that. <laughs> great. There are, right. there are possibilities, and I'm going to give you a little teaser. Somebody at NASA, honest to God, was actually working on this. But I'll, I'll, I'll leave that for later in the lecture, which we will get to. Awesome. Thank you. That's it for now, then. Thanks. Great. Okay. I hope I, hope I answered everyone's questions. And those were, those were really good questions. Yeah, Orion's amazing. It's just, part of you goes, how the heck can this thing work? You're shooting nuclear bombs out the back. They hit your ship and they push you along. Well, it's te technically plausible. And we could build it today. Um, the next concept came out in the early 70s. This is Project Daedalus. Now, do you know from your mythology, remember Icarus and Daedalus? Um, it was in, in Greek mythology, it was a father and son who escaped imprisonment on a Greek island um, by an evil tyrant uh, using a pair of wings that the father had made. And Daedalus was fine, but Icarus, he was so caught up in the art of flying, he flew too close to the sun, the wax holding his wings together melted and he plunged to his death. And this is why the, the this vessel is called Daedalus and not Icarus. Though ironically, there is a new version of this ship, which they call Icarus. But be that as it may, Daedalus, that's where the, so again, that's where the name comes from. Um, the British Interplanetary Society in the early 1970s they're an organization that's been around since the 1930s, and they still exist today doing great things like this. Um, they had a lot of very smart people on their team, and they got together and said, could we build, is it possible to build a real starship? Now, not that Orion wasn't, but Orion was really meant for flying around our solar system, even though it could technically be used as a starship. They wanted to know, could we build a real starship, a real probe. Now, this is unmanned. This would be an unmanned vessel. So they wrote a book together, and I it came out in around 1977 called Project Daedalus, of course. This one uses nuclear fusion. Now, you know, uh, you probably know about, do you know about nuclear physics, nuclear fission, where you split atoms apart, you hit them with other, you, you um, to make bombs for our nuclear reactors. They're all fission. That means you split apart the atom and the incredible energies that come out of it um, are used to, you know, nuclear power plants. Uh, also, sometimes uh, we do have nuclear spaceships in orbit, things, things like that. Um, fusion is something we're working towards, and apparently they just did something uh, approaching that hopefully will have nuclear fusion in a few years. Right now, though, fusion exists in two places. One, in our sun and all stars. All of our st all stars are powered by, well, I shouldn't say all, but most stars are powered by nuclear fusion, where you press atoms together. 
and they create even more incredible energies. And the other place that happens is in hydrogen bombs. Early atomic bombs were fission bombs, like the ones that were unfortunately dropped in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Those were fission bombs where the atoms split apart. This is where uh, new hydrogen bombs are fusion bombs where the atoms are pressed together and they release incredible energies in the process. Now, why don't we have a nuclear fusion plant powering our homes? Is because it, unlike fission, comparatively, it takes a lot of work and a lot of energy. Um, a hydrogen bomb is different. It's meant to go off and explode and destroy. So you can do fusion real quick, and you don't want it to be controlled. But obviously, if you want a nuclear power plant, you got to control it, and it's been very tricky and very difficult. But the 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 folks who came up with Project Daedalus in the 70s. Hope figured that they said, you know, in the next 50 to 100 years, uh, scientists and engineers would come up with a form of fusion that could be controlled. So they came up with this, the Daedalus probe. Now, how it works is we got it. You look, there's also a blueprint. If you look on the right here if my, with my arrows in the, at the top in this, this drawing, um, all the ins this is unmanned. There's no humans on board because this is gonna be a one-way mission. Um, up here are the probes that would be launched. They, they had, it has a whole collection of probe, little probes that would be um, used at the target star system, uh, huge telescopes, the computer brains, and even something called the wardens. They're little robots that would be controlled by the main computer brain in the ship um, to go out and repair the ship where necessary. Um, and at the front here, I don't know if you can see it, there's a thin line that's called, this is a beryllium shield. Now, uh, here's, here's another, this is, I wanted to bring up at this point, here's another problem with interstellar travel that does not get brought up in your science fiction programs. There is interstellar dust throughout our galaxy. It's pretty thin, it's pretty, you know, far apart. It, you wouldn't you wouldn't be able to breathe it. You wouldn't even notice it. But there's just enough that if you're and even though these ships aren't going at the speed of light or near the speed of light, if you're going fast enough, you don't want to hit even a dust speck. Now, for example, uh, Daedalus would do about 12 to 20 percent the speed of light. Very slow. That's relatively slow for star travel, but it's still darn f faster than anything we've built. Now. I don't know if you know this, but when you're in orbit around Earth, you're going about 18,000 miles an hour. You do not want to hit anything, even a, a paint fleck, um, because it can damage, you know, it would kill an astronaut, it could damage your ship. Uh, the International Space Station has little dings and dents from little pieces of other rockets and satellites, and even paint flecks that have pitted the windows and the hull of the International Space Station, simply because they're going 18,000 miles an hour. At that speed, they're like bullets. Well, now imagine going at 20% of the speed of light. Remember, the speed of light is 186,000 miles per second. At that speed, a hydrogen dust could create an explosion that would just wipe out the ship. So the makers of Daedalus put a shield up front uh, not also, they'd also have something, uh, war, a special warden called a dust bug, which would fly out ahead of Daedalus and spray uh, fine dust that would actually vaporize anything up to the size of an asteroid approaching the uh, approaching Daedalus. So this ship now in science fiction, they use shields, these electromagnetic forces, which you don't see and they forget about. But in real star travel, Hitting a speck of dust is really bad news, and you have to take it into account, or your mission's going to end before it even begins. So we have the, the shield, we have the, inst the probes, the telescopes, the computer brain, and then these are the um, deuterium tanks. This is where um, the deuterium, the, the, uh, the, the special material, hydrogen, is stored where they are then fired together if you see here see down here this this big cone at the bottom 
they're fired together in this conical area and it creates a fusion burst that pushes the ship along. It's a little bit like Daedalus, except not quite as violent or deadly. And of course, there are no humans aboard, but you still have to protect the instruments and the computer. Excuse me. So, <coughs> so um, Daedalus was planned in the 70s. It is also plausible, even though, as I said, we still don't have fusion reactors. And it was um, it was designed that it could reach the Alpha Centauri system in 36 years. Now, one reason it can go so fast is it's not going to stop. It would cause the <coughs> they realized with the limits they had of trying to be reasonable and technically plausible, Daedalus could not um, could not be slowed down. So it would go flying through the entire Alpha Centauri system in a matter of hours. And that's when it would have to send out its little probes to explore any planets, um, examine the telescope, and then beam back all that data, which uh, the people on Earth would be waiting for in about, it would take a little over four years to get back to Earth. So, and then Daedalus would just uh, careen off into space and th there, uh, that I, I don't want to say that would be the end of it. That's how the, the, the people that designed the mission was, oh, go off, leave Alpha Centauri and just drift out into the galaxy forever. I'd like to think there'd be a way um, they could send it to another star system if, if plausible, but see, the point is it would spend the first four years firing its, its rockets for lack of a better system where, and it would be kind of drifting. The other thing I never liked was the, um, the computer brain was going to be considered to be semi-intelligent and, and which I also take as aware. So my thoughts were, what's this poor computer brain going to do? Be drifting out in the galaxy with nowhere to go and no way to go anywhere else or return. So now you might say, well, you know, this, you know, is that plausible? Well, we are working towards artificial intelligence and we're going to need very competent AI to, to fly our starships. And then you have to ask yourself, will they be conscious? Will they be aware? Does that therefore make them intelligent thinking beings and they have to be accounted for? They didn't do that with Daedalus in the 70s. Um, and it might have sound, that might have sounded too wild for them. But it's really something to think about because we are now at a point, our, our artificial intelligence machines, they're not HAL 9000 from 2001, but uh, who knows what we'll have in the next 10, 20 years, and certainly by the time we can get starships to other star systems. But that's Daedalus. That was, um, again, one of the early, early and most famous um, starship concepts. And this might be another good time for oh, um, a quick sounds question. Sounds good. Go um, ahead. Somebody asked if we have existing tech right now that helps us to be able to actually work with the production for these starships. Yes and no. If we really had to start working on it, we could. Um, no one is building a starship right now, but... Here's something I can tell you now that I couldn't say to you even five, ten years ago. They are working on another kind of starship concept, which we'll also get to. And while no one's building it yet, um, scientists and engineers are actually getting together to make this thing happen. So we'll find out. That's another good question, and we will get to it. Um, so that... To, the best answer to your question is no, nobody's building a starship right now, even though the way things are going so well with our space program, thank, you know, Elon Musk and, what, and whoever else, um, you'd think it's happening. Oh, he does have a rocket, he, a big rocket he calls Starship, which is very poetic, but it is not an actual ship that could travel to another star system. So and just in case there's any confusion there. Elon Musk's starship is not a true starship. It's a real rocket, and it's going to be pretty powerful, but it's not a starship, and so no one's actually working on it. But yes, if if somebody had the money and the time and resources and said, let's to get, get together and build a starship, we could. As I said, 
um, with Orion, we could build Orion now. We have all the resources for it. And Daedalus, we need good working fusion, but it's also a, pl it's also a plausible concept in the next 50 years or so, should they decide to go that way. And remember, keep in mind, these scientists, they, they, a lot of times scientists do what they call thought experiments. They go, oh, what if we could do this? And they'll write papers on it and they'll have conferences. It doesn't mean the next day, unfortunately, people go out and start building them. But it, Daedalus was Daedalus is that. Nobody, nobody has built Daedalus, but a group of scientists in the 1970s said, hey, let's get together and think up how we could make a real starship. And they did. And they did. And that's why I bring it up here. Um, any other questions? Are we? There was another question about the um, the Vasimor uh, Vasimor engines. I don't know if uh, if you have those in yeah. the plan to talk about or anything, but no, um, because it, it's 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 another type of nuclear ship concept. Um, it's a nuclear fission concept, and it it has a few issues, and it's plausible, but it's not a starship per se. If it really worked, it could get us to Mars within a couple of months. And it's a real thing and people have been working on it, but it still hasn't happened yet. And since it's not really a starship, I didn't want to talk about it, but we'll be covering it. We've already had, we're going to be covering enough um, subjects here that, you know, we uh, will be talking about things like it. Awesome. Thank you. Of course, there's plenty of info online, but since it wasn't a real starship, I didn't want to bring it up here. Awesome. Thanks. Yep. Okay. Are we ready for the next starship? Um, in 19, now this is an even earlier concept um, that I'm bringing out later because it's even more advanced. In 1960, a fellow named Bussard came up with something called the Bussard Ramjet. And what you do is one of the problems with starships is, or any ship, you have to carry your fuel with you. Well, that makes your ship heavy, and therefore you need more energy to move all that heaviness, and therefore you need more fuel, and therefore you need more uh, need to be heavier, therefore you need more fuel, and onward and onward. Well, he came up with the idea of, what if you didn't have to take your fuel with you to propel your starship? What if you could collect it from the environment? And he came up with the idea of a starship with a giant scoop that would collect the hydrogen gas. Remember what I talked about earlier with Daedalus? Collect the hydrogen gas um, into the ship and it would be funneled down to fusion propulsion units that would then you know, activate the, nu the fusion nuclear reactors and kick the ship, in this case, almost up to the speed of light. It's a really neat idea. It's almost eloquent, eloquent um, that you could collect your fuel on the way, you know, convert it into energy and push your very large starship actually, um, you know, towards other star systems going at almost the speed of light. Well, guess what, boys and girls? There's a problem. <laughs> the hydrogen gas in interstellar space is really thin and far apart. And you see the scoop here? Well, it looks nice artistically, but in order to collect enough hydrogen to fire off these hydrogen fusion engines, you would need scoops the size of a small planet. And as big as Bussard, the Bussard ramjet is, the, the, the scoop would have to be ridiculously immense. Well, there is a solution. Um, you could use, instead of a physical scoop, you could create, generate a huge elect electric magnetic field that would collect the hydrogen. Now, of course, that would take a lot of energy and the technology to run it. Um, and that would create its own problems. But the idea is so eloquent that you don't, you know, you, you catch your fuel as you go, um, that scientists are still working on how to 
create, you know, create a magnetic field strong enough to collect enough hydrogen to kick in the nuclear fusion reactors to go at near the speed of light. So needless to say, the busted ramjet has not been built yet. Um, but it, it's, it's eloqu again, it's eloquent enough that we could, we could, um, you know, reach, reach another uh, star system with it at almost the speed of light if we solve the magnetic field collection problem. So there's that. And, um, and scientists have also, now you've probably heard this from Star Trek. Uh, scient oh, sorry, is there any questions on the Bussard Ramjet before I continue? I don't think there are any questions so far. Okay. I'll let you know if there are any. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so we've now, uh, scientists also come up with another idea using another form of energy. And you may have heard this, the antimatter starship. Now you may have heard this in Star Trek because the Enterprise and its other ships in Starfleet use antimatter anti as part of its propulsion process. The fantasy part, which is great, which is great because it is plausible. The fantasy part of the USS Enterprise comes in when they use something called dilithium crystals to focus the energy to have them go at warp speeds and therefore faster than light. Dilithium crystals do not exist. So, and we don't know of anything like them. So that's the slight drawback for the Starship Enterprise propulsion. But antimatter is real. What antimatter is, is a mirror matter, or anti, they call it anti, but a mirror, uh, a, a different charged particle of matter in our universe. Now we are, we, of course we call it, you know, our universe is made of matter. There's very little um, antimatter about, which is good because there is a blessing and a curse with antimatter. If antimatter interacts with matter, it creates a tremendous explosion. And of course, the more antimatter there is, the bigger the, mat the, bigger the explosion when it interacts with matter. Uh, to give you an example, one kilogram of antimatter interacting with an equal amount of matter would create the equivalent of 43 Hiroshima atom bombs. That's just one kilogram. That's unreal. Uh, you know, thus they said the blessing and the curse. Now the problem is antimatter doesn't exist very much in nature. We can create antimatter in facilities but they create very small amounts and it is extremely expensive. And then you have the other, now let's pretend we create an antimatter engine. We know that doesn't, you know, the cost is, it doesn't matter. You can actually have a ship made of matter, of course, with an antimatter engine. Well, the problem is of course, how do you keep that antimatter contained until you need it? Uh, one possibility is again, is using magnetic, because you can't, you can't put antimatter in a normal matter chamber because the minute the antimatter touches the matter, it creates a huge explosion and thus the end of your mission. What you can do though is magnetic fields would keep antimatter stored and not touching anything until you want it to, to create the controlled energy. Because think about it, all rocket ships, whether they're the chemical rockets we see now the the nuclear fission and fusion ships we've seen they're really all rockets are really controlled bombs they are controlled explosions that are used to get us from one place to another antimatter is no different in that sense but it's extremely volatile and you'd have to hope that the magnetic field doesn't fail because if that happens we're all anybody on board is in serious trouble um Again, antimatter ships are plausible, but there's a lot of work to be done. And part of the problem is right now, very little antimatter is actually generated and it costs extreme, a gram of antimatter costs in the trillions. And nobody's creating, nobody's generating antimatter. Of course, if they start doing it for starships and other reasons, um, the price could come down. 
but that's just one of many problems. So again, antimatter starships are plausible, but they have problems. So I have now presented to you um, all, some of the recent and current big production designs for for uh, send, you know, vessels that could reach other stars in our lifetimes. As you see, not trying to take the fun out of it, there's a lot of real work and there's a lot of real problems in physics and technology uh, to make them happen. Oh, by the way, I wanted to show you. Do um, you see the the hand? The guy's holding something in his hand. Um, his model. There's the real the antimatter starship. He's holding a uh, star destroyer from Star Wars to give you an idea of the scale of what you would need. Um, these starships, as we've seen, can get pretty darn big, especially using old as technology designs. So we now that we you know now that you have some idea that oh yeah it isn't going to be easy to get to the next star system despite what my science fiction program keeps telling me, and that's okay it's reality. Um, you find ways to work around it, and who knows what we're going to learn and develop in the process. Um, when we went to the moon with Apollo in the '60s, there were a lot of technical challenges. Of course, no one had ever gone to the moon before. When they started. When they said, uh, let's, when John F. Kennedy said, let's go to the moon in 1961, by the end of that decade, um, one man had orbited the Earth. We'd had some satellites in Earth orbit. We'd sent a couple to the moon, but nobody had done anything about building a manned mission to the moon. But they got together, they focused their energies, and by 1969, uh, humans landed on the moon. And in the process, we made all kinds of new technologies, uh, computers. They needed good computers, so they started making them smaller and more powerful. Um, you can thank those kind of innovations for the cell phones you have in your hands and the laptops on your desktops that are way more powerful than anything Apollo had, but they're the ones that got everything started. So when we start working in all these technical problems um, with real starships, we're going to learn a lot in the process. Even if we end up not having anything like a fast starship, we're going to we're going to get a lot out of it in the in the process. Not to mention also learn a lot about our our universe too. So, you might be asking yourself at this point, okay, it's really not easy to get from one even a the next star system, let alone fly across the entire galaxy. So. Is anything ever going to happen? Are we going to have anything in our lifetimes? Are we ever going to be able to go faster than the speed of light? I mean, forget that. Are we even going to be able to get a, a ship to Alpha Centauri uh, that I'll see in my lifetime? Well, as someone asked earlier, there is a real plan. Um, just a few years ago, uh, this group called Break Breakthrough Initiatives, started by a Russian billionaire, uh, has come up with a bunch of uh, incredible ideas and got it like a think tank of planning different things uh, like for SETI and and in this case, a probe to another star system. Now, this is called Breakthrough Starshot. And what it would use is a powerful laser aimed on a sail, a light sail, a big, big light sail, but very thin, that would push a ship to Alpha Centauri. And the, the laser beam would be powerful enough to get that mission there in just 20 years. Remember how I said Voyager 1 would take 77,000 years to get to the distance of Alpha Centauri? Well, it, of course, it wasn't designed to, so it's, it's, not, it's no one's fault. But this ship, oops, excuse me. This ship would be deliberately designed to push an, um, this ship, this mission would be deliberately designed to push the breakthrough Starshot to Alpha Centauri and do so in 20 years. And while the light sail itself would be very large but very thin, the probes would not be the behemoths that you saw before. They would actually be 
something like this. This, folks, is a starship. <laughs> Not technically, no, but this is a pro. This is a star probe. Remember all the monsters you saw before? Well, as we know with technology, things are getting smaller and more powerful. Um, Breakthrough Starshot could carry in its light sail a whole collection of these little probes. And as you see here, they'd have their own solar power. They'd have their own computers, their radio, um, and the wires would be antennas, and they'd have a couple of instruments. Now, you wouldn't be sending out one or – and you can see by the person's fingers how small they would be and how light they would. Now, you wouldn't be sending out one or two of these. You could send a whole bunch, maybe thousands. And the beauty of that is when you send out thousands of little probes, you can have them doing different things. Like, for example, you could have 50 um, with a magnetometer or gyroscope. You could have 50 more searching for light, just focused on searching for light. You could have another 50 looking, um, studying the stars, the stars of the Alpha Centauri system. There's, there's many possibilities with lots of little probes. You don't have to fit everything on one probe like you do these days. And another thing is, if you lose some of these little ships, it would be unfortunate, of course, but it wouldn't be the end of the mission. Um, you may remember a few years ago, we sent the Cassini probe to Saturn, to orbit Saturn. Well, Cassini was about the size of a bus, and every all of its instruments were on one big sh big space probe. If Cassini failed at any point, that would be the end of the mission. The beauty of light sail is, of the light sail with the breakthrough star shot is, you can send lots of little probes throughout the Alpha Centauri system. And if you lose a few, it's not the end of the mission because there'll be plenty to take its place. So I wanted to show you how concepts have changed whereas you know in the old days with big computers you needed big ships well now you can have lots of little ships with really with incredible computer power and amazing technology for um you know scan, sending uh sending uh scanning for data and sending it back to earth so this this folks is what the real future of a starship might be like and I wanted to show you something if we go back for a minute. Now, of course, Breakthrough Starshot has its own issues. First of all, no one has built it, but they really, they have already had meetings, inter, interstellar concept meetings, planning this. There, there, is a, there are, of course, some technical issues. Now, one of the problems is the laser that would be needed to push um, Starshot to Alpha Centauri would have to be in the gigawatt range. We don't have lasers nearly powerful enough at the moment. The, we, we, have, we have had gigawatt range lasers, but they quickly burn themselves out because there's so much energy going through them. We would obviously need a laser propulsion system that could sustain that kind of power for you know two decades or more. And we'd have to be careful to make sure uh, somebody ended up turning it into a weapon um, or things like, you know, things like that. Who's going to control it? Who's going to maintain it? Who's going to fund it? Lots of issues there. Lots of issues there. But uh, it is plausible. Oh, we also know light sails do work. We have already sent experimental solar sails, not only in Earth orbit, but around the solar system. So And push not by lasers, but by sunlight. So they do work. They do work. So this, <coughs> as I said, unfortunately, I cannot promise you that when it's going to be built or, you know, or how, but a number of organizations are really looking in to building this concept. And it is plausible, plausible using our current technology. And we so had a just question. Want to let you know. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt. Um, nope. We just had one quick question about uh, if if these uh, if one of these light sails got hit with um, you know, if the sail got torn or anything, is it possible <laughs> they'd have like a 
if it's possible, they'd, they'd supply like a backup one that would, um, that would unfold when, um, when their sale uh, fails, if it gets hurt or anything. That is a really good question. I'm glad it shows you, you remembered what I said about how, you know, dangerous it is to be flying at, at near light speed, or even in this case, you know, a fraction of it through interstellar space, because even a dust speck can destroy you. Very good question. There are solutions to this. First of all, these light sails will be huge. They might be hundreds of miles across. And you can build them so thin and, you know, that it would, it, you could do it. You could actually sustain some damage with these light sails that wouldn't destroy the whole sail and it would keep functioning. Now, granted, they'd have to be small hits. Um, the second thing is these sails would probably also be equipped with little robots that crawl all over the, the sail, constantly inspecting and repairing. So if there was a hole, I could conceive, I could conceive of these little robots going out like little spiders and fixing the holes. And then the third question uh, to answer the, the other part was, yes, this sail wouldn't be going by itself. They'd actually be launching a bunch of them. Obviously, I can't say how many, but it, this wouldn't be a single mission. There could be dozens of light sails carrying thousands of probes heading out there, not just to Alpha Centauri, but we have other nearby star systems to check out. We have, within 20 light years, we have hundreds of star systems. Um, and we now know a bunch of them have that thing we didn't know when, like when Daedalus was made in the 70s, we now know a bunch of them have planets. Do we know they have life on these planets? No, but we know they have planets and some of them are in the habitable zones of their stars. Like Earth is in the habitable zone of our sun, obviously. So yeah, they wouldn't just be sending out one, they'd be sending a bunch. So there are, there are yeah, there would be a combination of backups and the sail being really big and being able to handle a few hits, and I assume a robot repair crew to fix things. Awesome, thank you. You're very welcome. So that was a good question. That that uh, definitely enhanced that section. Now, suppose we can't just suppose we can't do breakthrough star shadow. We can't we can't go fast. We find out for whatever reason. We can't even go at a decent fraction of the speed of light, let alone warp drive, to another star system. What, do we, can, what can we do then? Well, we can get there. We can, we can traverse the galaxy. We can get to other star systems if we don't mind going slow and if we're sending people. And how do we do that? We build something called the multi-generational starship or world ship. What these are... Um, you can either hollow out an asteroid or build materials from asteroids. You can make these enormous ships um, that would literally be like Earth with Earth-like environments inside, uh, miles long. In fact, the Chinese are already uh, talking about developing miles-long spaceships. And I don't, while they don't have anything, they're, they're not talking off the top of their heads. Um, you could build these huge ships. Uh, put a crew inside, and uh, unless, of course, we find a way to have humans live hundreds and hundreds of years, these people could live and die and you know, have children and, have, and create a future generation that would make it to the next star system and that, to, to settle there. That's been something that's been thought of going back to the 1920s, if not sooner, of building huge ships putting a bunch of people inside, having them live out their lives, having children and, and making gener thus the word multi-generation ship until that crew reaches its destination. So now, of course, again, there's issues there. Um, you know, you got to hope that each generation will want to keep doing this. You know, will they, will they want to be living inside a giant ship being sent to some unknown destination that they didn't even plan on. I mean, technically you could say we're on, you know, we've lived on a giant 8,000 mile wide rock for all of human history. We didn't ask to be here, but you know, and we're just, and we're going in circles around a star. Um, you know, 
they would they would actually be on a mission having a destination. Now there's a lot been a lot of sci good science fiction stories on this, you know, playing out the various scenarios. That's one thing science fiction is really good at. You can play out all kinds of scenarios about human uh, development, societies encountering aliens, and do it from the safety of fiction. And yes, uh, people have written on multi generation starships. Uh, one of the most favorite, one that caught my attention when I was a kid, kid, and I do recommend reading, is called Orphans of the Sky by Robert Heinlein, a famous science fiction author. He wrote about a, a, a multi generation ship where <clears throat> at some point the crew, part of the crew, mutinied, and they did, the rest of the crew survived the mutiny, but it caused all kinds of problems. And then they ended up drifting through space for centuries. And then it turns out, now, they didn't have, don't ask me why, they didn't have windows, I guess, where they were or something, but they forgot they were on a starship. They thought the world, all of existence, was the ship. Uh, it's a fascinating read, and it gives you a lot of food for thought. Um, but there's been other stories like that. And uh, pe people play, you know, but you got to think about it. I mean, now, if you look at the picture here, that's one plot on the right that, you know, looks pretty comfortable, looks kind of like an Earth. And are curving up earth you'd have lakes and you know homes and everything i don't know i mean obviously this would take a lot of work but say for example um something was going to happen to earth and we were all you know we were, we had a, we literally had to escape earth um we might have uh, you know people might want to build these giant ships get as many people of it even inside inside it as possible and reach a, another star system, you know, or maybe people don't want to go to, other than visiting, they would want to live in those ships all their lives. You know, instead they, they, they would tour the galaxy. They, they'd stop off to visit a planet, maybe get supplies, um, but they wouldn't stay. They'd prefer to actually be in space in the ship. So that's, that is one possibility is if you, if we can't go fast, you know, we can just build a huge, a huge reflection of Earth, and you know, go that way, and just have the generations, a future generation, um, reach the stars. So the next, here's the next possibility. Uh, sometimes it isn't about us building a starship; it's about finding what's out there that might actually get us to other parts of the galaxy. And you probably, you may have heard this concept called the cosmic wormhole. Now, cosmic wormholes are, are supposedly holes in the fabric of space and time where you could use it as a shortcut to get from one place to another instantaneously. Now, we don't know that wormholes exist. They exist in theory. They exist in mathematics. Um, but we do, obviously, we don't know of any... Uh, Generating one would be just a little bit difficult. Oh, and so far as they also know, at the moment, most cosmic wormholes in reality would be incredibly small and wouldn't be last very long. So they're almost on the border of uselessness. If they're, they're too small to fit a ship through and they're not going to stay stable, you know, what's the point of trying to get through one, even if you could? you'd be stuck in some distant part of the universe and not be able to get back unless that was your intention. Now, scientists have talked about ways to make wormholes stable, you know, make them wider so you could get a ship through. But again, this is all very theoretical. But yes, wormholes are possible that they exist naturally in the universe. And yes, if we could use one, we could literally go in one end and come out the uh, in the other part of the other end of the galaxy assuming that's where it is you know in instantaneously but again it's all theory but i wanted to bring it up because they are plausible they're not but science fiction uses them a lot uh, but there's obviously again a lot a lot of work to do on them okay um I'm, I'm my next section, I'm going to be actually taught, you know, someone asked earlier, what about faster than light propulsion? Is it plausible? 
Um, I'm going to get to that next. I just wondered if anybody had any questions before I carry on. We do have a couple questions. Um, go, please, I did just please, notice, please go right ahead. And I just noticed we um, we did hit the hour here, so um, uh oh, we can well, I'm getting towards the I'm getting towards the end. I was saving the awesome. yeah. We are getting towards the end. I'm saving the big finale. <laughs> no problem. Um, I'll just hit on a couple of these questions real quick, maybe. Sure, um, sure. Or Kai, did you I'll, be to, I'll be to the point as much as I can. Awesome. Yeah, I, I only expected it to be an hour, so I might have to go in the next maybe five minutes. No problem. Okay, I can I can wrap it up, but I there is there is I have one more slide that I know people want to hear about. But yeah, go okay. ahead. Oh, you want me to go ahead and do that instead? Okay. Uh, maybe we'll just hit uh, one question real quick that came up was sure, um, sure, sure, sure. Uh, one of the intergenerational ones. Um, oh, how would multi they generation multi generational? Multi yep. Right. Um, how would they be getting light since there's no sun nearby or anything like that? Very good question. Again, uh, they would probably use some form of nuclear power to uh, generate artificial light. Awesome. Thanks. Okay. Um, very good question, by the way. So. Now, someone asked me earlier on in this lecture was, is there a way to go faster than light? Well, guess what? You know the warp drive you've heard of? In 1994, a scientist uh, whose last name is Alex Cubier did the math, and he found out that, yes, warp drive is theoretically possible. And by warp drive, you literally stretch space so that you can move ahead of it. It's almost like cheating. Since our universe doesn't let you go faster than the speed of light, you just warp space around you to move it aside so you can go faster than light. I'm giving the real basic description here. Now, so it that was, believe me, I remember when this paper came out, people are like, wait, it's it's plausible? Yes, again, it's plausible. There is a problem, of course there's a problem. To go to create warp drive, to create the ability to warp space and time, you would need something called negative matter. Now, when he originally wrote the paper, you would need negative matter about the size of Jupiter. Jupiter can hold over a thousand Earths. It's, yes, that's a lot. He did get it down eventually to the size of a bus. I don't know how. But he did. The problem with negative matter is it does, we don't know if it exists yet. It's not antimatter. It's a, it's a different, it's not antimatter. It's matter with negative properties, for just lack of a better description. So the problem is if you don't have the thing you need to create the warp field, Warp drive just can't happen. But it's nice to know that in theory, it's not totally out of the picture. So, and I have, this was my last, um, get right to the end here. I thought, uh, can't, not, not too much to answer here, but I asked too, was, you know, myself too, was, are there, you probably asked yourself, are there other beings in the galaxy exploring deep space with interstellar vessels? Well, if they're older than us and have lived longer and survived going through their cultural adolescence, they could have made all these ships or, or things we can't even think of, and they could be out there flying now, uh, exploring the galaxy. Maybe we'll meet them someday. So, you know, it's it's plausible. Or, you know, in, or conversely, we could be building the ships and heading out to them. So I'm um, just to wrap it. So to wrap it up here, I, I hope I at least whetted your appetites and your intellects about real possible Star Treks. And I want to thank you very much. And if we have any time, I'm, uh, I appreciate your attention. I'm happy to answer any questions if you have them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Larry. Um, it okay, looks like we do have you. one more question um, popping in. Uh, it okay. says, oh, yeah, sure. I think. Go right ahead. I'm, I'm listening. If humans evolved in the past two, 200,000 years, is there a higher chance of aliens existing? Oh yeah, there's. Remember, I said there's 400 billion stars in our Milky Way alone. 
and each almost every one of them has a system of planets we now know and there are at least two trillion the number's gone up in the last 20 years we know of at least two trillion galaxies of hundreds of billions of stars each in our known universe so and and the universe is made of many of the same elements that we know of and have um so i'd say the the odds are pretty plus it's pretty possible there is. We haven't found any yet. We have no scientific evidence, but I'd say the odds alone are pretty good. But if you're wondering why we're not getting visited every week, we now, through my lecture, we now have a pretty good idea why. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and one more question pops in about uh, yep. uh, Kupoplitz uh, drives. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Say that again. Uh, uh, it looks like Cooper Blitz drives. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly or if. Uh, Can they spell it? Can you spell it? It's spelled uh, in the question K U P U L B L I T Z, but I'm not sure. Uh, they said they weren't sure if they spelled it correctly. I. It's not ringing a bell. There are, by the way, I did not talk about all the possible Starship drives there are. Um, cause I wanted to focus on the main ones that would get the, you know, the general idea across like there's, I don't know, maybe that's the one about where you could use a, a mini black hole for a starship drive. Guess what problems that creates? <laughs> I don't, I'm sorry. I don't know. I don't know. I'm not sure what that is. I'm, I'm, I apologize. No problem. Um, yep. Oh, it looks like they were saying that is actually the black it hole the black thinking of. Yeah. Yes, um, it's also plausible, but first you have to find a black hole, and then you somehow have to put it in a ship and not have it pull you in and destroy you utterly. You know, <laughs> <laughs> so there's those, as you notice with starships, just a few little problems. Right, right. Minor deet. You know, I know, I know. On science fiction, they have a guy come fix things in ten minutes. Yeah, we gotta. You know, if we want to really do it. It's going to be a little more complicated than that. Hey, if we could, it'd be unreal. You know, but anyway. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I guess we'll give one last quick call for, for any last questions in the chat, but otherwise I see some people are hopping off and saying thank you. Um, well, thank, thank you very much to all of you for taking the time. Yeah, and, and thank you to, to Larry and, and uh, thank you, Kai, for helping me host today. And of course, to Miss Brodsky for bringing everyone here. Um, yep. And, and thank you for all the questions and all the activity in the chat during this whole thing. Everyone's been great. Yeah, those were great questions, by the way. They really enhanced my talk. They really added, you know, because I couldn't, I, I didn't want to add every little detail. So they, they did that, you know. And I want to thank you guys, all of you, all of you. You did great. Thank you. I really appreciate, you know, because last time I was on my own, I had Julia, but it was I was on my own. So you guys kind of helped. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad. Yeah. So... Awesome. Thank it looks like everyone's you. saying saying thank you and bye. Um, sorry. Thank you. Go ahead. No problem. So the next time you look up at the stars, you know, oh, you want to know something? Uh, what I wanted to say really quick was, did you see um, Avatar? Not the terrible, yeah. not the terrible cartoon from the cartoon, <laughs> the Avatar, you know, with the the Navi and all that that James Cameron made. Yeah. Did you know that is only on for five minutes in the beginning? Do you know that starship that delivered our hero to what was the Alpha Centauri system, by the way? Did you know that was also one of the most plausible starship concepts um, ever shown on screen? I didn't. That's that's incredible. <laughs> if you look it up, if you're interested, I, you look it up. Again, I would I could have talked for another hour on all the different concepts. It's an it's an antimatter ship, but it's um no, is it anti? I think so. He based it. Um, on a real starship design. And I, when I saw it, I was like, oh my God, this thing really is probably one of the better ships ever shown in terms of reality. If you look it up online, you can read about it. It's amazing. And it was only on for like five minutes. You never saw it again. <laughs> but I'm definitely you know, you gonna that up. That's the credit to how much work James Cameron did. Even little things like that get deep attention to detail. That's like Kubrick level, you know, 2001 Kubrick level. So I just wanted to bring that up because that always fascinated me. It's like I was looking at going, that's a real plausible starship. 
That isn't just something he threw together and said, who cares? <laughs> oh, what's it called? Um, it's called the Venture Star. The corporation that's mining the unobtainium, I love that name, on the, on the planet where the Navi live. It's called the Venture Star. As in capital venture. Not exp That's the thing, too, is we always think everything out going out there is for science and exploration. Um, just as equally, it could be for commerce and economy and territory gain. Just being, just being realistic. Right. You know, because look, our space program is now being dominated by um, the space industry's commercialism. And it's great in one way because they're actually, you know, they're getting out there. They're doing, I hate to say it, they're doing what the government's been faltering on. But they're also out there to make money. And that has its good and bad points. You know what I mean? So that's one thing I thought in Avatar that was also kind of realistic. They weren't going there to explore. They were going there to, to mine this material and make lots and lots and lots of money. And that could be just as real. All right, when the Europeans came to the New World, you think they came here for science? No, they came for gold, territory, and unfortunately, slaves. That's that's the reality, not what I wish it to be. Right. Wait, he says, how was it spelled? The ship? Is it a uh, venture, venture like that? V yeah, venture and then star, two words. It's a corporate ship. Literally, it's the corp, the corporation, the mining corporation. That's their ship. Yeah, if you look it up, if you do Avatar Venture Star, um, you'll learn. You'll actually see there's a lot of detail on it. All right. Well, if there's no other questions. Um, I, I think, think we, can, <laughs> we can we can sign off. It's been great. Thank you so much. Um, yeah. Sorry, and, I went and a little. For... Sorry, I went a little over, but. Oh, no thank you so much, Larry. It was amazing. It was such I, a pleasure. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for the opportunity. I really enjoyed this. Thank you. And it was nice. It was nice. Uh, Kai and Ryan, it was nice to meet you. Too. I mean, Julie, of course, I know you. Um, Kai and Ryan's really nice to meet you. And whoever Luca, Be Luca is, I don't know. <laughs> Hello, Luca. <laughs> so thank you very much. Thank you very, very much. Awesome. Thank you so much. Okay. You guys take care.